often would you see someone in an Allegro, some angry guy at the back of a queue, getting wound up, everyone's driving slowly, in a brown Allegro? That probably wouldn't happen very often, would it? For those who might not know, this might be before their time, this is an Austin Allegro, or sometimes known in the UK as the Austin All Agro. It's a car that came out in 1970, damn, 72? 73 no 73 to 82 73 to 82 austin allegro people hit the comments tell me i'm wrong this is an allegro mark ii i don't know if it's known as an allegro II or a series two or a mark ii but there were three types of allegro the very early ones which had a famous or infamous little quirk about how they were set up in the interior and um, then there was the mark ii like this which is probably one of the more common ones you'll see in the classic car world and then from, damn, 79 to 82, there was the Mark III, which had bigger headlights, I believe, a different grille. It was a bit more Austin Rovered as opposed to Austin or British Leyland. It was that kind of, yeah, it was the same time when the princess became the ambassador. And I think the number plate got moved onto the boot lid, if I remember rightly, on the back. But we'll get into that later. Well, we won't get into that later because I don't know. So I don't know why I've said that. Basically, these cars get a bad rap in the UK, they get a hell of a lot of hate. Uh, and I wanna know if any of it is misplaced because I enjoy cars that have a lot of hate. I drive, I love my Citroens as everyone knows. And that's kind of like, I'm coming at this from a Citroen point of view, like. Oh. The suspension I'll talk about in a minute. Also coming to it from the world of TVRs. Oh, you can't, you can't drive down the road in a TVR without someone going, oh, how many times is that broken down? <laughs> Never. Never broken. Oh, no, have I? I have broken down on one of my TVRs. I have. It's a lie, I have. The alternator was overcharging. And it made all the gauges overread, including the fuel gauge. And I ran out. Hillman Imp, another car I've got. Oh, you can't drive. Yeah, we used to have one of them. We used to put bags of cement in the front. Oh, the head gasket used to go. <laughs> so... Is the Allegro kind of like, for those in the know, is this actually like not anything like as bad as people make out? Or is it genuinely awful? I don't know. I'm going to find out. The first thing I can't help but look at is the looks. I'm a wordsmith. These get a bit of hate, but as far as I'm concerned, looks are subjective. And I drive cars that people laugh at and think are ugly. So I'm not bothered by that. One of the things I am bothered about, and straight away i read this last night i only read a handful of things last night in bed and one of the things i read made me want to bang my head against the wall you see the shape of the car so you would imagine no why is it not a hatchback that's the single stupidest thing about the car so far and we're only a few minutes in why is it not a hatchback why do you know why? Well, I don't know if it's true, but I've read on Wikipedia. Austin, or be whoever they are, BL, Austin, Rover, Leyland, Morris, Triumph, whatever. They didn't want to take away sales from the Maxi. That's what it said on Wikipedia. I don't know if that's true or not. Hit the comments if it isn't. But the logic is they didn't want to take away sales from the Maxi. So they wanted this to be a saloon. Has anyone noticed the obvious flaw in that? The Maxi was their car as well. They're gonna wonder what the hell I'm doing. The Maxi was their car as well. It doesn't matter which one they sell, as long as they sell one of them. But no, let's penalize this one. So now, if you don't like the Maxi, if you don't like the look of a Maxi, you can't consider an Allegro because it's not a hatchback. And if you need a hatchback, because you need to get your stuff in the boot through a gap that is bigger than a letterbox, it's not a bad size boot. It's just the access to it is, is just ridiculous. It's the Citroen GS all over again, or the Alpha said. I don't know why they do it, but at least Citroen, when they got the GS, when they, re, when they facelifted it, they went, you know what? When we make the GSA, we really should make that hatchback because that's really dumb. I imagine it would cost quite a lot to rejig it as that. And I'm guessing BL were running a bit low on money at the time. So when the Allegro 3 came along, they probably did want to make it a hatchback. I'm going to assume, because I'm going to assume that some of them had brain cells, but they couldn't because it just didn't have the money to do it. Uh, and of course, the Allegro eventually was replaced by the Maestro, which was a hatchback. But one of the things I can't help but notice in here 
is the space. There's a lot of, of it, right? But none of it's flat. The floor is not flat. It's just like the inside of the body. It's like looking in the TVR boot. It's the inside of the bodywork. Can you see? Probably not because of the light, but it's just, there's no double skinning at all. It's just, what you see on the outside is like the, well, the inside is what you see of the inside of the outside. Does that make sense? It's like looking at the underside of an egg carton. It is at least, however, a decent sized boot. That is pretty good. You can't fold the seats down. I don't know why. Well, it wouldn't matter, would it? You can't get anything in there anyway. But now this is a 1300 Super, much like the Hillman Imp, um, which I have. I have a Hillman Imp Deluxe. Deluxe is the bottom of the range in Hillman Imp, and it would be bottom of the range with this. This is a, th a 1300 Super. Um, I don't know what the one above this was. Didn't they do a random Pla version? I don't think that's a bad looking back end. I actually don't. It's different. If that came out in 1973, most cars were like three box saloons. It's different. It could have been even better. Let's have a butcher's in here. Now, one of the things this car does not have, and everyone is going to be looking at this going, why have you left the ignition on? And oh, no, I haven't. One of the things this car does not have is a square or quartic steering wheel. I don't entirely know why they did this, so I'm going to have a go at remembering what I've briefly read. I think the reason they did it is because the steering column is quite low set. I'm, I'm not entirely sure it is because it actually doesn't feel like a terrible driving position, but the steering column is quite low set and their logic was that if you have a big wheel, you'll rub your legs getting in and out. So if you have a square wheel, you'll have a flat bit along the bottom, which will give you more room. Unless you left the wheel turn. But they got rid of that in the uh, Series 1. In fact, before the Series 1 went out of production, I think they ditched it. And they replaced them with round wheels like this. And I believe these were deliberately quite small. And it is, I mean, it's not a small wheel by modern standards. But for a standard of the day, that's actually quite a small rim. I mean, well, the rim is thin as well. But yeah, it. It is quite a small wheel. That's one of the quirks it could have had. But it doesn't, because it's a Mark II, and the Mark II's never had the square wheel, so it's not a thing. Oh look, has it been hot wired? Build quality test. It hasn't fallen off. Now under the bonnet of this particular Allegro we have an engine. Oh no, they've all got that. But you'll recognise this engine if you like your old British engines. That is an A-series. It is basically, I am told by the owner, who is also uh, a man with a YouTube channel, his name is Alex, and his channel is called All Things Alex. But I don't think it is All Things, I think it's just cars, I'm not sure. It is effectively a mini engine, um, to the point that a lot of Allegro's were harvested for their engines, for the minis. It is the standard uh, gearbox in the sump. I love the fact that the engine sits dead straight in the car, it's dead, like, because it hasn't got a gearbox on the side, it's not sat to the side. So the the weight, the weight alignment, you know, the, the weight distribution even, to give it its proper name, is, is brilliant. Now that is the 1275 version. This particular engine would have originally been the 59 horsepower, I think, A series, and is now technically most of a 64 horsepower A plus, which come out of a series three Allegro. Um, but it's for all intents and purposes it's the same kind of thing overhead valves push rods it's not a remarkable engine it's a legendary engine it's a well-known reliable engine tough they respond well to tuning you ever watch the minis racing around in the mini championships you'll know how much fun they can be but i'm not really bothered by the engine i like the fact it sounds like my old auntie's metro when i was a kid but i'm not here about that you are wondering what on earth is that and that one over there, what is that? And that one's all pitted, look. They are, I believe, well, no, oh, I don't know what they are. I have didn't read it enough. See, I, I have this name, and the word in my head I have is displacers. But in my head, that's a sphere. And I wonder if the displacer is the thing that acts on the sphere. I don't know. I don't know how this works. Really, I should get underneath one and, like, crawl around and figure it out. But for all intents and purposes, it is kind of kind of like a citron i know 
That's crazy. Did you know that? I bet this is a common look from the 70s, isn't it? Uh, basically, the difference between this car and a Citroen is this car has a system called Hydro Gas. That is an evolution of a system called Hydro Elastic. That's the one that everyone goes, oh, Citroen's got them funny Hydro Elastic suspension. No, they don't. They have Hydro Pneumatic, which is this on steroids. This is a very simple version of that. The guy who designed this, Alex Moulton, I believe, uh, he took the Citroen system as his inspiration. He thought, they're right, a gas compressing a, an oil, or an oil, I should say, compressing a gas is a way better springing mechanism than a coil spring or metal. And he's right, it is. But they're hideously complex. Citroen had all sorts of patents and licenses, so you couldn't actually just use the system. In fairness, they spent a lot of time designing it, so they probably thought, we don't want people to use that, not without paying us money. So he came up with this system. And I... <laughs> There's a guy I watch every now and then, uh, when I'm in the mood, called Julian Edgar on here. And he did a video once, and he said in that video, his, for his money, Hydrogas was, was better all round than Citroen's Hydro Pneumatic. Yeah, we're going to boogie dog. <laughs> I know, just chill, listen. It isn't as good a performing it was his argument but if you consider everything if you consider the output what the car can do how it drives how smooth it is everything like that versus reliability complexity cost you think uh, the citroen is better but for all that added complexity and cost is it that much better well we're going to find out that's one of the things i want to find out today Hydro gas, in essence, is kind of like a Citroen in that you've got a sphere on each wheel, like a Citroen does. There's a membrane in the sphere, the gas on one side, oil on the other. Or sometimes water, I think. I think some of them use, like, antifreeze, something like that. Um, and basically, when you go over a bump, the, it forces the fluid up, and that squeezes against the gas, and that is your spring. There are other ways they deal with shock absorption. Absorption. But that is basically what it is. And on a Citroen, you have a central circuit which goes all around the car with lots of pipes and there's a pump on the engine and regulators and valves and everything like that. And it keeps the system maintained. It's a live system. This one's not. This is a closed system. It's like someone's blown up a balloon and tied a knot in it and put it on the wheel. Whereas on a Citroen, the balloon is blown up but it's still connected to the pipe that blew it up. And it can blow it up more or blow it up less if it wants. It's more clever. It's kind of, that's a very simplistic way of putting it. But that's kind of the way they did it. Only with hydrogas, and I, I, I'm going to get slaughtered in the comments. I know it, but I've read it. I've literally read last night before bed for about five minutes. I believe the difference with hydrogas is that the system is interlinked. So if you compress the front, the displaced fluid that was in the front acting on those spheres tries to go to the back. And you would think to yourself, well, that's not necessarily a good thing because if you compress the front and it tries to wrap the back up, if the front's gone over a bump, the back's going to shock over it as well without even hitting it. And then it's going to hit it. Yes, there is that. But one of the key things about getting good ride quality is getting rid of pitch. Pitch and dive. This is the, like, it's almost more important than how soft it is. I know it sounds mental, but it is. It's one of the things that Citroens do amazingly well, apart from the C6. Uh, it's one of the things that Citroens do amazingly well. The early hydroelastic cars did struggle a little bit. This one, I believe, I'm putting myself out here because I've no idea if this is right. This one interlinks the front and back. So if the front end goes over a bump, like a speed bump, the front wheel compresses, the fluid that was in the front gets displaced and has to go to the back. Because it goes to the back, although it makes the back react to a bump that hasn't even gone over, a downside, it does lift the back up. So if the front's gone over a bump, the car doesn't do that. It kind of does that. The idea is that it stops it pitching and diving as much. And that's, well, we'll see how effective it is. I've deliberately not driven this car much because I want to convey exactly what it's like to you. but. That's basically the in a nutshell how they did it. And I think on I think in metros, I think early metros weren't interlinked and the later ones were, and that was one of the criticisms of those. I think some of them, maybe even this one, when they're interlinked, I think it goes from the left front to the right rear and the right and the left rear to the right front or something like that. I'm intrigued by it, genuinely intrigued by it. 
other than that, I, I don't dislike the way it looks. I'm just gonna come out and say it. I don't dislike the way it looks. I think for its, the wheels are tiny. There's a humongous gap in here. I mean, you definitely wouldn't want to go to France in it because you'll come back. Someone will probably be trying to sneak into the country in there, but huge gaps. Quite low profile tyres, quite surprised by that. What size are they? 155713. And they are well, going all cracked and splitting. The original looks for this car, Harris Mann designed it. And I watched a program way back when. In fact, I told my wife last night I was driving the Legro today and she remembers watching the program with me. And she said, do you remember seeing that picture that the guy who designed it showed them of what he actually designed? Honestly, I felt a little bit teary when I saw it because the thing he designed looked amazing. It looks so good. But then BL came in and went, well, no, you can't do that. I can't remember exactly why they had to change some of the stuff they changed. I think the roof line's higher than it was supposed to be. I think the bulkhead is higher from, if I, it's got like a, a marina heater box or something in it. It's like you're going to change the look of a whole car to accommodate a heater box from a different car. Okay. I thought Citroen were nuts. It's not seeing the wood for the trees, isn't it? That's what this was. They've shot themselves in the foot by trying to be clever and economical. They've completely shot themselves in the foot and made it much more of a failure than it actually could have been. I don't think it's a bad looking car. I mean, already I see people sniggering at it when I was driving here. But, I mean, it is poo brown as well, maybe. Russet brown, this is. I don't think it is that bad. I think, I think it's the wheels that led it. I think the wheel, I don't mind the design of the wheels, but I just think the arches are massive. The body of the car is quite, there's quite a lot of body. And then it's got these little diddy wheels. It looks a bit strange. Maybe if they were a bit slightly bigger, a tuck tuck. Sound like one of them youths, isn't I? Right. So have a quick look inside it, and then we'll go for a run and see just how rubbish it is. Or not. Right, you'll have to excuse the uh, jaggedy camera again because it's getting hot. And it <laughs> another day that's fairly warm. So there we go. A fairly basic interior, but I believe the deluxe model has a smaller instrument cluster than this one. One of the things I noticed straight away is how small these windows are. I don't know, I have to look at Harris Mann's original design, but it does feel quite a high shouldered car. You do feel quite cozy in here. We've got a glove box with some crap in it. Um, God, it's very, well, I would say that I'm not gonna judge it because it is from the seventies, isn't it? And the only thing I can really judge it, compare this with is my uh, Hillman Imp which is very much not standard, or, I mean, I do have a Citroen SM as well. I can compare it to that. Some might say that's slightly unfair. They're slightly different price points, but I do have one. Now that mileage there is actually genuine. It has only done 33,000 miles. It's got a bit of a history with it, this one, but it's basically only ever had three tax discs. So I think the one in the window there is its third tax disc. I think that's a 1981 tax disc look at that welding man oh is that standard or not i don't know decent space in the back the leg room's good the, the seat is more like a sofa i mean you compare this was this would have been a rival to something like the escort or the viva or something like that and i have to be honest with my limited time with it i'm sure the escort probably was a better steer in terms of things you, you know flinging it around the countryside and the escort wasn't a bad looking car that wasn't a particularly exciting looking car but it wasn't a bad looking car but this is a bit more out there and i believe that was what they wanted i think they were actually using the citroen gs as, as inspiration they wanted to make something to show that britain could do engineering we weren't just making sort of sideboards with wheels so let's go and find out if it actually drives like a Citroen GS. I don't think it will. It's a bit of an unfair comparison, really. But will it be as bad as everyone makes out? I'm not so sure. Let's see if the Allegro is as bad as people make out. And I'm going to sweat in here for a little while. You also have to bear with me. I'm going to just put up with the, uh, the camera, I'm afraid, because it, it's going to it's going to have an aneurysm when it sees the sun. So we are driving an Allegro in the UK in 2024. There's no one here to laugh at me, but I wouldn't care if they did. Their problem, not mine. Um, so what am I noticing? Well, I'm doing 50 and it is noisy, very noisy. 
Now the engine's quite smooth. I basically, I've, I've done a slightly different route today. I've brought it down a road which I know how Citroëns handle this road. And I'm, I'm not gonna be unfair to the Allegro and, and kind of hold it to the same standard that I would hold a hydronomatic Citroen because they are more complex. They can do more. It's like trying to compare an old CRT telly to a modern, you know, flat screen LCD, whatever. It's like, yeah, they both do the same thing, but one of them is more expensive. So, it's loud, this car. It's 60 mile an hour, it is noisy. And quite slow, if I'm honest. It's not happy at 60. I mean, the ride is okay at 60. It gets a bit, it gets a bit choppy, but... My, old, my first impressions are that everyone's being unkind to the Allegro. Think bike. It's a car from the 70s. I don't have huge experience of cars from the 70s. I drive a lot of cars from the 80s. My main bread and butter is cars from the 90s, probably. But... rides better than so much else you could have got back in those days. Back in the 70s, you still got cars with leaf springs. Did the Escort not have leaf springs? Mark 1 and Mark 2 Escort. Yeah, it's a little bit like this. It can't settle like a... a I'm not going to keep comparing it to a Hydro Citroen. Um, because that is unfair. That's like trying to, you know, a Hydro Citroen is a more expensive, more complex car, basically. But you have to compare it to other conventionally sprung cars at the time. And if you do that, this, this really isn't bad at all. It's very, very good at taking the bad bumps. So if you if you see something coming and you think, oh god. It's really good at that. The brakes are not fantastic. Um, this one has got quite warm or quite warped discs, apparently. And apparently, which is the second time I use that word, I'm told that brake discs are hard to find for these cars and expensive, which seems crazy. But apparently, this is the sort of car where the parts can be hard to find and they can be expensive. I mean they only made 600 and something thousand Allegros from what I, from my brief reading last night. Over the period of what, 10 years? Is that 10 years or just under 10 years? So that's a similar sort of number to Hillman Imps that were made over a 13 year period. Okay. So I was going to go for fourth then. I think the gearing's quite... The, the final drive, I, my gut feeling is the final drive's quite short, quite low, but the gear ratios are quite, like, they're quite far stepped apart. Because it does struggle going up hills in fourth gear. It's not something that happens so much in the Citroen world. You quite often find you can just keep keeping momentum going. That said, I am stuck. It's Sunday and I'm in the countryside, so I'm doing 30. Because I'm driving Miss Daisy's out in front of us. I can't help but feel bad for the Allegro. I think it's maligned. I, I think it's unjust. Based on this. The suspension is quite strange. It's, it is quite, it's a, it's a bit citron -y, but it's the Citroen's cushion. So they'll take a bump and then they'll cushion the movement that comes afterwards. This doesn't, it kind of reacts like a spring. It kind of like, I'm, I'm gonna to get to the end of this road and turn around and come back because I've not been able to find out exactly what it's like going around corners in it, really, because we're stuck doing 32. Kind of cute. So I'm going to try and... How often would you see someone in an Allegro, some angry guy at the back of a queue, getting wound up, everyone's driving slowly, in a brown Allegro? 
the driving position's all right. It's actually quite nice. The seats are abysmal. Um, that's one thing I have noticed. And these seats seem like they've collapsed. And it's only done 33,000 miles. But I can, there's a bar going across your ass. There's no support, nothing. I am going to turn around. Excuse me, everybody. I'm just gonna, I can't deal with sitting in this anymore. Right, so this is a horrible bump, Jesus Christ. What's the turn and circle like? The turn and circle is... Decent, decent. Bit of blue smoke, it's fine. The turn and circle's good, here we go. Right, so now we can move. Now we're doing 41. Round the twisties, this, here we go. Is it that bad? I'll have to wait until I get to the, because it's still accelerating. There we go, we're at the top of the hill. So it's a bit boingy, but it's not as cushioned as a Citroen at all. Um, there we go, the 60 limit, the national speed limit. In the countryside, on the A road, in an Allegro. It's a little bit, you know, it's not quite as cushioned. God, it's loud. It's so noisy. It does the same thing over crests that Citroëns do. Gets a bit confused. It doesn't handle badly at all. That's one of the things I'm kind of... One of the things I'm noticing, it really doesn't handle badly. It's got a strange feel with the body roll. If you're going around slower corners, I mean, we're going faster ones now, but I've noticed a couple of times, if you're really leaning on it in slow corners, it sets up a little bit of body roll, but then it just kind of like, it does lean, you know, it's not cornering flat, but it's kind of like it, it hits a second stage where it's like, oh no, I'll start fighting back. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit silly. Oh, when you, yeah, okay, so. Bloody hell, those discs. Jesus. Um, yeah, okay, right, so. Around town, it can hold a candle to Citroens, this system. I believe it can. It's really not that, my God, these brakes are horrendous. Um, yeah, it can hold, it, it can. At slower speeds, it can hold a candle to Citroens. Uh, in the countryside, no. Not even close. It's uh, it's nothing like as composed. You can't maintain the speed. You know, Citroen, you can take the take bends at high speed, regardless of the road surface. And this is the same for all of them, even back to DS's. They just glide all the way down a country lane. You don't have to slow down. You just attack it. Um, this gets all out of shape. It gets all bouncy, and and this this has just been repumped or regassed, I should say. The system on this car is just been redone, repumped up, reset, and everything. So it's about spot on, basically. There's no knocks from the suspension. It's it's tight. So the handling is actually quite good. If you've got a nice smooth. A road that didn't have the undulations and the bumps and things. Um, I actually think the handling would be all right. The grip is good, very neutral, really neutral. Takes a bit to you know to unsettle it. I have tried already. Uh, good grip. I think really for what the car's built for and for the sort of market it was built for and for the people that they assumed were going to buy it. I think it, it's actually pretty good because it would have been made to just deal with crap roads, like crap you know, bumps around town like that. There's a bump there. It didn't. Re it, was, it, it could have really shaken itself to bits over that, but it didn't. The engine lets it down, and the brakes let it down. And the high speed stability is not amazing. That said, I have to put it in context again. 
if you drove a Mark II Escort down there at that speed, a standard one, not a rally car, you know, or a Viva, or something from that era, would that be any better? I don't know. Send me one, I'll find out. But, yeah, I think, compared to a Citroen, no, it can't do what they do. Is it unfair to suggest that it should be able to? Yeah, possibly. But it does do half of what they do. Around town, over the bumps, the ridges, it does a good job of ironing out the rough edges of the road. Even by modern standards, it does a good job of that. Steering is fine. It's, it's not quick geared or anything like that. It's not, not brimming with feel, but it's fine. Visibility's good. I love these little windows. I just, they feel quite cocooned in it. It's just so damn loud. Alex is taking this car to Rustable in September. Um, good luck to him. I thought Hilda was bad. Hilda is worse than this. On the motorway, Hilda's worse than this, but this isn't much different. The engine is smooth. It is smooth. It's just very loud and being smooth. Just going over a section now that Citroen's actually absolutely take the piss out of. But normal cars do struggle. <laughs> yeah. Nice try. To conclude the test, I'm just going to head into some more technical roads. But so far, I have to concede, I'm kind of taken with it. I quite like it. Genuinely. I don't think it's that bad. Especially now, in 2024, this has got charm. It's also got really knackered brakes. Um, this has got a lot of charm. 2024 this is good fun a lot of youths are getting into retro cars and classic cars now and I'm seeing it and it's good I'm liking seeing it make sure look at these these are not a valuable car this is not a valuable car it's not a sought-after car it's not a fast car either so the parents will love it You could have such a nice time, four of your mates in this, heading for a little holiday. Most of them are five door, four door I should say, which makes more sense. I can't see why you'd buy a two door one. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Right, here we go, technical roads. It's not that effortless gliding down the road that I like with my French cars, but do you know, it's not bad. It's not a perfect suspension system at all. It has downsides and upsides, but then all cars do, don't they? It's, it's stable. The handling is safe. It's stable. It's grippy. You're not going fast enough to get yourself into any real trouble either because it doesn't go fast enough to get into real trouble. Probably never been driven this hard for most of its life. But oh wow! <laughs> it's got it's got grip, I'll give it that. It's good fun. It is good fun. Now we I've just come to the conclusion. It is good fun. Hello, you will have to excuse the lack of mic. Um, my mics have just died. This is going so well this morning. So there's the car, I'm concluding. Um, I'm gonna say it loud and say it proud. I like the Austin Allegro. I think it's all right. So uh, thanks for watching. I'm gonna go back now and try and see how much power it has.